everyone. Welcome again to Susquehanna Valley Church Podcast. I am especially excited. We got some amazing guests with us today. Um, as always, we as, a, we as a podcast team want to put out some stuff. We want to help you think about stuff you need to think about, talk about stuff you need to, to talk about. And uh, man, I don't know of a truer statement than uh, what we're going to talk about, what we're going to challenge you to think about today. So why don't we go ahead, gentlemen, and you can introduce yourself give us a little bit of an idea of who you are and what you do, and then, then we'll roll right into a topic that is just huge in our nation and huge on my heart. I know it's huge on your heart. I, I believe it's huge yeah. on the heart of Jesus Christ as well. Uh, but before we roll onto that, why don't we go and just you say hi and say who you are. Well, my name is Harrison Cook. I am a um, pastor, mental health counselor here working at the Salvation Army uh, rehabilitation facility here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. But prior to this, I've been in pastoral ministry for over 20, actually 30 years. And um, I just want to say to to you, Matt, I want to thank you for having this forum and inviting um, this forum to happen on your podcast and to reach out to the black community. Uh, to have a conversation of this magnitude regarding um, the situations within our community is going to take some uh, openness and some understanding. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that you will uh, hear and your audience will hear may be a little uncomfortable. And I'll only say to those of you listening to this broadcast, if you are not part of the solution, then you are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And the only way you will understand what black lives and black community is going through is to get an understanding and this is something that we will give to you because of the experiential aspects that we have gone through so taking this into consideration with the love of jesus christ within my heart i am going to say some things that probably will make you uncomfortable yet it's enlightening truth that you must embrace and come to understand if you want to help the situation I love it. I love it, Harrison. Look forward to being challenged with that um, mm -hmm. and, and seeing what God's going to put on your heart to share with us. Um, Eddie, why don't you go ahead next? Certainly. It's so good to be with you. My name is Eddie Cross. And like uh, Pastor Harrison Cook, I've been in ministry plus 30 years as well as a, as a lead pastor. And uh, currently, uh, I operate as a team of pastors the national church of over 21 nations uh, right here in the Harrisburg community, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I travel the world uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord has blessed me for a plus, oh, I would say a plus 14, 15 years of uh, doing this kind of work, strengthening the churches, uh, you know, really to people from the churches. Customer engagement and, and the overall customer experience. So our conversation today, um, as Harrison, Pastor Harrison has said so adequately, uh, will be uh, challenging. Um, it'll it'll really push us to the to the forefront of of solutions and not just you know having a listening ear. Uh, but I would further say that uh, there are some uh, uh, things that we can do locally, regionally, and even nationally if we just put our minds to it. I think we can excel and really uh, begin to bring the answer to the, to the uh, challenge here. One of the things I want to throw out here real quickly, uh, and this is not an original thought of mine, but it's something that I've captured as a heart of the Ministry of Reconciliation. And that is, in a world that's ever-changing, everybody needs a sacred place. Now, that I did create with my own thoughts. However, this next thought is, is that the only solution for a chaotic and changing world is the church and Jesus Christ. So in a, in a society that is broken, the only answer is Christ and his church. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, I, love that, uh, I love that thought process. I think that's huge for where we're going. Um, I, I want to start out with a question just to be real, because I think uh, everybody comes to this discussion with a history and a bias. But we act like racism is either you're, you're all on racist or you're not at all. I think we all struggle with some level of not understanding each other. And, and I think that's, that's just vital for us moving forward to get to a place where we can learn to listen 
um, and appreciate what God has done and how he's worked and what other people, where they've hurt and where they've struggled. Um, I, I guess the first question, and again, I represent a church that that is uh, is primarily white, um, and, and I wish that were not the case, but that just happens to be how it is. And I look forward to, to learning some things through this that we can broaden our audience. Um, but one of the things that I, I want to ask is, what what don't we see on on my side of it that, that you gentlemen wish we would see? What don't we understand? What questions aren't we asking? Go ahead. Um, well, Matt, let me just say um, the the situations within our country didn't just start uh, in the last few years. This has been going on for some time, and and when we look back to the idea of uh, racism or we look to the idea of bias within uh, ethnicities we can actually go back to biblical times Amen. but bringing it more recent uh, when i'm thinking about this uh, we, we're talking about a, a person by the name of henry the navigator i don't know if any many, any of your parishioners really understand uh henry the navigator was a portugal uh missionary or person who came into the areas of africa to Christianize black savages, to give them an understanding or to make them come to realize that they need a saving savior. Um, uh, I've traveled in, uh, internationally as Eddie has too. And um, to be honest with you, they didn't need that because they had something already. But what we understand now is that we're dealing with what I call a classical conditioning. It's the mentality and the thinking of individuals that have been conditioned or culturally conditioned to believe a superiority over another race. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was breeded in by Henry the Navigator, and it's something that is permeated even down through the ages in which we're living in. I, I would add to uh, the thoughts that Harrison is, is bringing up uh, from this pictorial. Uh, where when Brown... Uh, and various other shades uh, from various parts of the world have come to the United States. One way or the other, we've been laboring in the same field, lifting various loads together uh, because of our condition as the, the things that people didn't like to do or, 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 or found to be cumbersome. And, and yet, at the same time, what has happened for the African or more specifically the African-American, is that he or she had to become bilingual. Mm -hmm. They had to not only understand their language, their culture, and their way of doing things, they had to immerse into a culture, learning the language, learning the culture, learning the way things are conducted. But then on the other side of the spectrum, our brothers from another hue, as Harris and I would say, you yeah. don't have to do that. Because <laughs> it's your world, quote unquote, and we got to adjust and you don't. And so what yeah, happens right. is the misunderstandings start right there. Because mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is that there is a richness, there's a quality, there's an essence to our experience that is just as vital and just as significant as the folks who are from the European community. And I'll, I'll go further to say, even from a theological perspective, every time I talk about the progression of Christian faith, we think about it from a Western and a European yeah. perspective. Yeah. We start off with Martin Luther. We mm -hmm. run down to John Wesley. We go to Parham. We even run down to Billy Graham. And, you know, all those brethren, yes, they have this contribution, wonderful insights, in terms of the development of the, of the Christian believer, but never from an African perspective do we look at the first bishop that came out of Africa and his contributions yeah. in terms of his writings and theology that really set the precursor for European uh, Western theology. So, you know, it, it's amazing how we'll shift in these ways, but we won't take the, the posture or the understanding of saying, hey, what is your world like? What do you guys have contributed? What is the essence of it? And so when we get to that place, I think we can begin to really do some really serious uh, growth. 
Yeah. 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 And let me go back, man. You mean, and let me just piggyback on that because the cultural conditioning of the mindset of people were taught that others were superior and some were less than. And to get this notion that blacks were inferior to whites be based on the fact that they owned, they had land and whatever, we were kings and queens of the area in which they came to accost us from to bring us to this country. So when we're talking about the actual aspect of racism, we have to even go back to, to King James himself, who was a known racist, who taught things and eliminated things from biblical precedents that we would not be added into the culture of Bible as we know today. But uh, don't, you know, the idea is that there's, there's some, some black blood that ran through Jesus' veins, if you want to understand this aspect, really. And to understand how we are labeled as inferior we are actually we're equal or we are brothers and sisters in christ and until we learn and until we come to that understanding that there is no male nor bond nor free nor jew nor gentile but we're all one in the body of christ we will not be able to do anything to take take away for this systemic racism or institutional racism in our country today yeah i i uh I resonate with what you're saying, the idea of that superiority. Um, one of the books that I recently read is a book called King Leopold's Ghost, and it talks about the colonization uh, mm -hmm. uh, of Africa and um, how it was just so misconstrued and how it was yeah. wrongly portrayed as this, this really act of humanitarianism. And, and it's really just grotesque uh, treatment of human beings, which we, I think we as Americans need to understand some of that history. Yes. And, yes. and again, ask that question of how can we, how can, what can we personally do to get rid of that superiority, inferiority, and how can we contribute? And we'll get specific with that. But before we get there, um, uh, one of the things that really opened up my eyes was reading John Perkins writing a book called God Dreams, where he talks about how he thinks the church should be at the forefront of racial equality in America, and I could not agree more, you know, Harrison, for the scripture that you're quoting there. Um, it, I mean, it's there. It's out of the words of God himself. This is equality. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to look each other in the eye as if there's no yep. difference through Jesus Christ and his blood. Um, but but what really opened up my mind was, mine was John Perkins talking about his children experiencing that. And it, it mm -hmm. literally made me cry thinking about my kids and what I would think if my kids went off to a school um, that was segregated and, and it was going yeah. through that transition. I, I want to hear kind of some of the experiences maybe that you um, or your children or your congregation have, have dealt with to help mm -hmm. us be able to resonate with your pain. Well, well Matt, first of all, um, John Perkins, I'm, I'm very familiar with because I know John Perkins. I knew John Perkins. I know John I. Perkins. Yeah. So, so, so we, we talk, you, you, you raised some relevancy because we know who John Perkins is and we were actually in company with John Perkins. So to, to hear him say being in Jackson, Mississippi and see, let me just, you know, I pastored not only in, in the Midwest, but I pastored in the, the rural South. And, and, and one of the areas which I pastored was, was Sunflower, Mississippi. And, and it's a very, very segregated uh, portion of Mississippi, very poor. And the thing is, is that they were taught not to go to certain places and not to do certain things. Me as a rebel, me as a person coming down the pastor, I said, well, we're not gonna stand for this. We're not gonna, but we're going to, you know, try to eradicate some change and bring some relevancy into the community. Um, the thing is, is that, I never experienced racism until I left Detroit, Michigan, where I was born. Mm. And I went down into the South because in the Michigan area, it was pretty much, you know, covert racism. But down South, they'll let you know, okay, fine. We don't like you. We don't want you. And, and that was fine with me. But the thing is, it was not going to stop me from trying to bring about some change. And I, I remember the day that I, I actually going to school I, I, I went to school with some white kids, okay? I went to all black schools. I went to school with some white kids and they were trying to talk to me some kind of way. Being a Northern boy, I wasn't standing for it. And my parents, you know, were always trying to tell me to, to, to be, be quiet and not say much, but see, as you know, I'm a talker. 
Eddie. <laughs> so I'm not going to hold my peace, but you know, I'm going to educate, then I'm going to legislate. First of all, you're going to know who I am, you're going to know what I am, and you're going to know what I stand for. But you're not going to, uh, you, you're not going to marginalize me, you're not going to minimize me, and you're not going to undervalue me as a person. I'm going to tell you who I am, I'm going to educate you who I am and what I'm all about, and then I'm going to do it with the love of Christ. But, you know, yes, I've, I've seen it on both sides, and uh, I still see it. I, I saw it just last Saturday. Out on the golf course, people drove by me and they hollered out the name. You know, it wasn't my name, but it was an end name, but it wasn't me. But they just shouted out to me. And I said, you know, this is what we have to go through. This is what we got to deal with, you know. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, a, a northern city as well. Um, and so the uh, level of racism was cloaked uh, outside we were treated well but in terms of being embraced in terms of uh, places to be educated uh, it had to be uh, we had to be bused into certain neighborhoods to go to school mm -hmm. of equal quality and uh, the busing experience started for me when i was nine years old in the fourth grade i was taken out of my neighborhood a safe and secure location, which I really loved and embraced. And I was taken to another part of town, which was about 30 to almost 40 minutes away, uh, wow. to a school that was uh, 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 predominantly white. And uh, I was e immediately immersed into that culture. And the teachers treated me as well as other students of, uh, of African-American descent horrible. Uh, mm -hmm. My mother and my father had to consistently go to that school to stand up and say, you will not treat my child as a secondary citizen. And so uh, that experience was raw. It, it was painful. Uh, but it also taught me how to engage and relate to people outside of my own experience. I, I had to learn how to speak up. I had to learn how to speak well. And yes. I, I actually take that almost like a little insult, to be honest with you, when you hear someone say, oh, Eddie, you speak very well. And yeah. I'll think to myself and say, doggone it, I sw speak well because I am an educated, I am yes. an intelligent, I am, you know, a diverse individual. It's nothing special about me. I can name 20 other people that speak just like me. So, you know, even though they meant it as a compliment, it was an insult. Um, uh, and I, I, I get it because they were watching uh, Good Times and JJ and some of the antics of some of the other programming that was in the 60s and 70s that gave off a portrayal of black life in such a way that didn't reflect how Harris and I grew up. We grew up in a very solid working class neighborhood where our dads went to work. Our moms didn't have to work. My dad worked, my mom stayed at home and raised the, the children. Uh, we, we, never, we never lacked for anything. We weren't moving around. We weren't uh, you know, waiting for the electric man to turn back the lights on. Yeah. None of that stuff was a part of our experience. My, my dad provided the best of foods. Uh, we, had, we had clothing that we considered to be uh, extremely adequate. And, uh, and we were happy. I didn't know that there was a struggle that was going on that says that I am less than until I stepped into that world. So one of the things as I sort of want to bring my thought to a, a wrap up here, and that is, is that I had decided long ago that as, as proud as I am to be an African American, as much as I love my hue, I love my, my, my culture, I love the way we eat, I love the way that we engage one another. I am a man. Yes. I'm a man first. Yes. I'm a man that's been saved by grace. And I happen to be of African descent, born in America as a rightful citizen with all rights and privileges. So, that's right. you know, and, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a little heightened right now, so I probably need to back down. But yes. where I've been denied is my rights. Uh, and I've been, my, my, my. I've, been, I've been looked at. Uh, mm -hmm. as one who can't do a certain assignment because yeah. of my color. 
I, I literally, I don't know what Harrison did. My wife and I literally on purpose didn't name our children certain names because we wanted them to have an advantage of, look, of, of folks looking at their resume or their application and getting a job. Yes. Today, and I know very much about this because I've been in human services. There are people, mm -hmm. they'll see a name and if it looks African or if it looks African-American, they will bypass it and yes. move on to the next one. Yes. So I got kids that are named Jonathan Edward, Brandon Christopher, Candace Victoria, Christian Keenan. And I did that because I love those names. They got meanings and, and things of that nature. And I selected them independent of my culture. But I also had in the back of my mind, I can't name them uh, Malik because no. somebody like Betty is going to get weird out seeing the name Malik or Malcolm and, and all of a sudden deny my child the opportunity of getting employment or getting into the, uh, uh, their college experience because of the context of their name. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a truth that is new to me to learn some of those things. I appreciate your, your openness to sharing um, some, some realities that are not, not pleasant and, and come with baggage and come with uh, the difficulties of what it means to be inferior, which, again, most Americans, white Americans, have not experienced it, especially in the ways that you guys are. I, I told a story on another podcast of just uh, driving down uh, or, yeah, driving down a street and seeing a guy with a with a big pickup truck with a Confederate flag waving, waving out the back. And I'm thinking, I've never seen anything like that directed at me. Um, and, and so then the question is, do, what do I do with that? Do I, do I just overlook that as, oh, that's just part of our society? Or do you guys, as you guys are saying, is there, are there things that we can do to love people who are different than us? Are there steps that we can take as a church to help heal some of this? Um, yeah. And, and I love a phrase that you guys are mentioning. Um, you've each mentioned now talking about your culture, which I love that because it's true. It's your culture. And the assumption has been for many years is, well, this is white American culture and you have to, you have to assimilate in order to be successful in our culture, as opposed to you know, us saying, what is it about that, that culture that is God designed and God placed within you that we can appreciate and we might learn from. You know, we might take some things Matt, and say, you're, you're yeah, more Matt. welcoming and loving. Go ahead. Yeah, see, see, one of the things that, that as, a, as a Christian clinician or as a Christian therapist, uh, one of the things we're taught is cultural diversity and, and learning how to do cross-cultural uh, diversity counseling. And see, here's the thing, is that, see, in a, in a Hispanic community, if you see a bunch of Hispanics standing on the corner, talking loud, waving their hands. People will interpret that community as being uh, a very violent or very, you know, a forward a kind of community. Blacks standing on the corner, having conversation, having loud noises, waving their hands. Now we're, we're treated as if we are criminal thugs and that we're about to start trouble. But basically all we're doing is having conversation just like those Hispanics were. And the thing is, is that we're looked upon as being, uh, we, we are taught by, well, the, the community teaches you that to fear us, but then also the community is trying to make us fear them by utilizing symbols and monarchs that need to be torn down, which are being torn down to promote racism and cultural aspects within our community to bring about fear within the African-American uh, society. I'm going to tell you this right now. These young folk right now today, which are living in our world, came up in an era where they had segregated schools or integrated schools. And, right. and they don't see no black, no white. Right. Back in the day, we had to go to that situation. But what is going on in America today, all of these revolutionary marches that you see, these folk are sick and tired of what is going on in our society. And it starts from the top down. We're talking about institutionalized racism. We're talking about systemic racism. And right now they're having a hearing for George Floyd's uh, uh, brothers for about the, the, the lynching. We, I'm just going to call it what it is. The lynchings that are taking place that are televised. They used to just take pictures of it, but mm -hmm. now they're televising lynchings that are taking place of black folk. 
And these same white folk that will march down the street with guns, they're being treated as if they're just normal citizens. But you let one of us go down the street with the guns, they'll accost us and take us into a jail. Right. Right. Yeah, it's amazing that you bring that point up. I want to go to address the Confederate flag uh, in, yeah. in a more detailed kind of way. Harrison uh, certainly uh, put his finger on it. I just want to press on it. And, and okay. that is, is that when, when, when that flag is shown, it is, it is a symbol that's saying to anybody uh, who uh, is African American, as an example, that we want things the old way. Yep. The way that we think it ought to have been. So it, it means slavery. It means Jim Crowism. It means segregation. It mm -hmm. means, you know, this, this craziness of we live in a country of over 350 million people, but 80% of those incarcerated are black and brown. Yeah. That, that, is, mm -hmm. that is the most insidious thing that I've ever seen. But it speaks to what Harrison brought out the systemic root of racism that is just built into the system of this nation mm -hmm. from 1919 to this very day. Yes. So, yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Who in mm -hmm. their right mind would think that a portion, the, a smaller portion of the overall community of America is 80% incarcerated? Mm. That's ridiculous. Yes. And they want to throw off things uh, such as social ills as the leading curses of these things. They have impact. I'm a social scientist. So by virtue of my uh, uh, educational background, I get it. Yes. If you grow up in a fatherless home, if you uh, 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 don't uh, finish high school, uh, if you uh, don't get the proper health care, uh, if you don't have employment, yes, more than likely, you will end up in jail. That is not the leading cursor. The leading yeah. problem is the systemic, deep-rooted racism that because I act a certain way, talk a certain way, hang out a certain way, mm. there's got mm. to be something obviously wrong with me. My and God. then we get treated so differently because yes. of, and I'll give you one example right now my baritone voice because i speak in a very uh booming kind of loud kind of way that becomes very very offensive to yes, a, 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 a white person um mm -hmm. they will think that i'm angry that i'm mad that i'm yeah. upset and the truth of the matter is i'm passionate that that's the key right there and and I, I will say the African-American community uh, ha, is much less reserved in their passion. And right. again, I think that's a God designed thing. I think that's something where I can look and I can say, but that's incredible. I love that you can be so passionate in your expression, especially in your worship. Man, I wish we weren't so reserved and afraid of what the person next to us thought. I want to ask a tough question because um, I think that's why, why we're here. Um, so, so you're talking about the protests. What do you say to the group of people? And I hear it, right? I, I hear it from multiple people. I see it on Facebook. What do you, what do you say to the people who say, I understand what they're doing, uh, you know, that they're upset, but there's got to be a better way. That's a statement hey. I've heard a lot. There's got to be a better way than the protests. Or, yes. and, and, and then I'll turn it over to you, or they're saying the emphasis is on those who are committing the crimes and they're saying, see, if they want to change the stereotype, that's not the way to do it. Those are tough questions. I want to put them out there. You go. Harrison, can I jump in real quickly? And I'm not going to talk about it. All right. Go I, I got to get this out because he'll, he'll say it before I say it. And I want to say it. All right. So uh, uh, real quickly, um, a, a few years ago, uh, when my son was in high school, he was angry. And I didn't know why he was angry. I didn't know why he was angry at me. I had no idea. I, I was just perplexed. I mean, I bought the boy Nikes. I put him in the best mm -hmm. school. I gave mm -hmm. him a car. You know, he's, he lives in the suburban community. Uh, he's got his own bedroom. M more, more stuff than I've ever had. And he was just ticked off. And I, and I couldn't put my finger on it. I'm going someplace with this. 
So I'm at home and I'm watching some videos and up pops an old video of Dr. King. And this is what he says. He says, the language of the unheard is violence. It's rage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it quickened me. I mean, the Holy Spirit actually used that old clipping to speak to me about my own son. And I said, oh my God, he thinks I don't hear him. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he is raging, he's violent. And, and so let's just take that to the larger community. Again, I told you I'm a social scientist. So relationships, group dynamics, they move from the smaller cursor, they grow to the bigger one. Hey, listen, the reason why folks are marching, protesting, and in some cases exercising this rage of violence is because they feel unheard. We didn't try yeah. to express it. We tried to tell you. We tried to, you know, uh, write papers about it. We tried to debate with you about it. We tried to even demonstrate, but can't be heard. No one believed us that we were being chased by police. No one believed us that, you know, um, I, I have to... I have to behave a certain way. My sons have to be a certain way. I had to tell my boy, hey, I don't care about hoodies being in vogue. Don't wear a hoodie, period, when you're driving a car. When a police officer stops you, put your hands on the steering wheel so you can yeah. see them or keep them lifted up with them open. At each demonstration of his command, ask permission if you can do it. If he says, I'd like to have your license, you must say to him, may I get my wallet out of my back pocket because, sir, I don't have a gun. Mm -hmm. so you, and, and because we got to go through all these hoops and all these demonstrations, because y'all get weird out. When I say y'all, I'm talking about the white establishment, the white system. Y'all yeah. get weird out because we ask a question just like the next boy who happens to be white. Why you stop me? What did I do wrong? And in one case that we just saw, the guy's headlights was on, 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 on high beam. And high the police beam. was not offended. Yeah. And crazy is that? Yeah. So, you know, I just wanted to jump in there real quickly and throw that out there. Harrison, I no. hear you. You got you you got it you got it Eddie and and the thing is let me just say is that I was having this conversation with some of my peers and and they were asking me about you know what's going on in our society and I said to them that we've had enough yeah what 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 has to be done what what do we need to do you know um, nobody's listening nobody's I don't agree with all of the the, the rioting and and a lot of the looting. But let, let me just let's, let me be clear. Uh, the rioting and the looting, the looting started with you all. Let me go mm. back and just, just bring some things to, to mind. Back in 1921, when there was a such thing called the, the Oklahoma, where they had the Black Wall Street and blacks were fruitfully gaining their, their, their way in society and they were making headway in, in their communities economically. And the wealth was growing. White folk didn't like that. And basically what they did is that they went in and killed 6,000 people, burned down in Tulsa, Oklahoma, looted their areas, and began to say, you know, because they were just getting too far ahead. They didn't want that to happen. So the idea of the looting and the, the rioting, it didn't just start with us. It was something that was going on back in the day but nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to say these things happen. So, but when we do it, we are now criminal, or as the president says, we're thugs, or we're called hoodlums. But the biggest hoodlums came over on the ships that took the land away from the Indians and was saying that this is their land when actually it wasn't theirs at all. They stole it. So we're talking about crooks and hoodlums running our country today that are saying in legislation. And so therefore, if you, if you put stuff in federal legislation, it's going to trickle down. Now, let me just tell you something. You know, if I were to bring a quarter out and ask you what the value of the quarter is, you would say 25 cents. If I would put a dime on the table and ask you what that value of the dime is, you would tell me what, 10 cents. I put a penny out, you say one cent. But if I put a token on the table, then what would you say that value is? Basically, you would say you wouldn't be able to determine it because the value of the token is what the person deems it necessary to be. And this tokenism within our country, black tokenism has to cease and stop. We are not 
devalued by what you see us as. But we have qualifications and identity that define us who we are. Fleecy locks and black complexion does not forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in white and black the same. Rise so tall as to grasp the pole and to reach the ocean at a span. I must be measured by my soul because the mind is the standard of a man. That's what William Booth, I mean, uh, 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 George, I mean, uh, uh, John Booth said back there in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm just quoting him verbatim. You can't judge me by the, 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 the hue of my skin, but by the intellect of my mind. And so what we have here is we got some culturally conditioned minds that are sick. And I'll get to that a little later on, because I'll define that in a way that I think your and people I, will And understand. I want to throw in here on top of that robbery, I yes. was robbed of my language. Ah. I was robbed from my tribal community. I was robbed yes. from my food. I was robbed from my way of living. I was robbed from my royalty. Yes. I was robbed. I don't, I don't even have my own last name. No. I've been robbed. And so then you press mm. me down and put me into your world. And see, this whole violent piece, let me tell you what it does. Because I, Harrison and I grew up, we were born in the 50s. So I was, yeah, I went through the 60 riots. <laughs> right. You went through 60 riots. And, yeah. and I, I saw them as a young boy. All right. Check this out. Historically, for those of you who don't know, it wasn't until Watts was burnt down that the civil mm. rights legislation went through. Yep. Yep. See, riots got the attention of white Americans said, we got to do something. We got to mm -hmm. give these people equal education, equal rights in terms of housing, uh, e e education, uh, housing, uh, 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 employment. We got to do something. So all of a sudden now we find in the 1965, 66, 67 legislations during the Johnson administration where all of a sudden we got those things. But we, we, had, we got their attention when we started burning stuff down. Yes. Unfortunately, I don't agree with that. I don't think no. it's right. I don't think mm -hmm. violence is an, is, is an issue. I'm a believer. I believe in peace. But, but, but when you don't listen, that, look, the, the whole thing with regard to uh, I can't breathe, well, that, that boy said that back in New York City a few sure years is. ago. They're but gone. No one listened to us. Yep. No one listened to us. And it was filmed. And those cops got off. And you, yes. you know why we're ticked off? Because it happens over and over and over again. But this time, this man didn't do nothing wrong. Caught on film, and we begin to move forward. And the marches not only go through America, but they're in Europe. They're in South Africa. Yeah. They're in Japan. People are marching and saying, you know what? That's sick. And if you don't change it, something is going to happen. And so now we got legislation popping up. Why? Because we're going to burn something down. And that's yeah. unfortunate, but that's the only time that white America seems like they, they can hear us. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, let me just, I mean, I know you, you're recording this, and I told you this is going to be some things that might be uncomfortable. <laughs> but, but some of these things we have to address. We have to address this thing called qualified immunity. You, you know what qualified immunity is? Is that when you have a, a legalized doctrine or a piece of legislated law that shield government officials from being persecuted best based on their dereliction of duty. What they do is that they can, they can choke out an Eric Garvey. They can choke out a, a George Floyd. They can shoot an Aubrey, uh, 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 Ahmaud Aubrey. They can shoot, uh, 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 what is it, uh, uh, Breonna Taylor, and yeah, get off on what is called qualified immunity because they were actually doing what is called their duty because they were threatened. You know, we have to address these things not by looting, but we have to address them by legislating new laws. And this is where you all come in, because in order for you to help us, we first of all have to give you the understanding of what we're going through. Now, if you embrace that, then what you do, you come alongside of us and help us change legislated laws in our community to help us out. Not only us out, but help out the church. Yeah. Yeah. I I appreciate, I mean, there's so much information here. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually, we're going to stop the conversation in just a minute and we're going to then keep going with it because we've got to have more of this and we need to talk more about the solutions. Um, but I, I just kind of want to bring the first first episode here to a close with this. Um, and I want to kind of you know circle back to um, 
God's word and and the heart of this all. What is a scripture uh, right before we wrap this up? Uh, what is a scripture that you want us to to know and to keep at our heart um, as, as white evangelicals? Mm. See, I was actually while we were talking, I'm, I'm, I, I, it, Eddie was talking about it earlier, and, 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 and what came to my heart is that you know, you know, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, mm. but the violent they take it by force. And the thing is, is that some things we have to press through. We got to press up on not only the mindset of people, but we have to press up on the kingdom that things have to change. And so if that's, a, if that's something that I think that uh, we need to get people to understand, that we're not violent people, but we are passive. We are passionate people trying to get folk to understand that we are part of the kingdom of God, just like you are. Amen. Mm. Amen. Mm. Yeah. And the one that comes to my mind very quickly is that God reconciled the world to himself. Yes. And as a result of that reconciliation, he has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. And then the verse closes off and says that you and I are to be ambassadors for Christ. Mm -hmm. So what I really sense and believe that what has to happen where the church comes in at is that uh, we're going to have our political lens. There's no doubt about that. I'm not against your politics. I'm against the attitude of your politics when it's about yes. injustice. Yeah. And so we have to have a conversation with the church is, is that, hey, it's not blue or red. No, it's, it's not. not. It's not Obama versus Trump, which is the craziest argument I've ever heard because yeah. Obama's no longer at the White House. However, that's a conversation that keeps going on. It's really about this idea of the church coming together and saying, the Lord has put us on equal ground. He's cleansed us. He's saved us. He's healing mm -hmm. us. He's delivering us. And we as brothers ought to be shoulder to shoulder walking together in this ministry of reconciliation. Absolutely. All. Because this, as much as this is racism, it's really classism. I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I love it, guys. I love the stuff um, that even is going to be uncomfortable for, for, for people to hear. Um, but we've got our mentality, and it's influenced by our upbringing. And, and here's the thing that I've learned about loving people from other cultures is uh, and, and going to learn this, going to the Dominican Republic and connecting with people. Um, and from a standpoint where you're the outsider, you've got to learn to say, if I'm going to love these people, I'm going to make some mistakes. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm yes. going to have to learn that the way that I've been taught is the only way and the right way to do something might just be a different way to do something. And what does it mean for me to actually love somebody and get to know and say, how did God wire you to think and to love and to speak? I, I'm, you know, I, I could talk about that, that, that language being robbed from you guys, because who are we to say that God wants well-spoken English to be the language that we should all have? Maybe there's things about your dialect and your, your culture that are more beautiful and more precious to God. Um, and, and the very idea that we're going to get to heaven, we're going to speak English and we're all going to be white is, man, that is, that is sick. <laughs> It is wrong. You guys are getting me fired up now. <laughs> Last I heard, God speaks in Hebrew. Unless I heard God say the scriptures talking, he spoke Hebrew. So I think we really got a big challenge now. <laughs> we all gotta learn. <laughs> hey, uh, so oh, here's what gosh. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna we're we're gonna we're gonna pause the conversation for now. Okay. If you wanna hear what my favorite scripture the one that god put on my heart is you're gonna to have to check that check next next week guys uh, so thank you for listening into the podcast uh, we hope that it makes you talk about stuff you really need to talk about think about stuff you need to think about because this is real it's it's at the heart of jesus christ um, and, and he died for all men just the same so we got to get this right the church has got to get it right so love you and, and check back with us next week